Let's see, long story short, I was looking for, for ways to get involved and to keep tabs on what people were doing to provide uh, support in my area and trying to track what was going on across Brooklyn. Turned out that uh, this group, Bed Size Strong, has been, I think I can say, like one of the models of uh, building a, a robust, relatively decentralized mutual aid network with a really interesting tech stack that's supporting the whole thing. So uh, all that said, it's a really interesting thing to see happening during a really difficult time. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that George was able to come from the bed -Stuy Strong uh, tech team to show us what they've been doing. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you now, George, and thanks again for presenting for us. Thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, so bed -Stuy Strong is a mutual aid group in Brooklyn. Um, our kind of understanding of mutual aid is, um, I think, summed up by solidarity, not charity. So it's neighbors supporting neighbors, um, all volunteer run, no employees. Uh, and so all of that um, work and you know resources that we've pooled um, are largely coming together to deliver groceries to folks in our neighborhood. Um, largely that's people that can't leave their homes, um, elderly folks, people with disabilities, um, immunocompromised people. So that, um, that's just one of the arms of bed -Stuy Strong. We also do things like supply PPE to nurses. Um, I think as of this week, we've done a thousand masks to Kings County Hospital. Um, and there's also a whole culture that's kind of flourished on the Slack. Um, I'm a lead for the automation team, which is um, the core team's four people, um, two engineers, a data scientist, and a product manager. Um, and most of my work has been focused around augmenting the intake process and the delivery process from getting a request from neighbors, triaging it to um, displaying that so that our delivery volunteers can claim and um, go out and do requests and then also how do we refund them and provide them with enough money to actually complete a request? Um, so kind of how this is structured, I'm gonna go through the uh, iteration of our um, automation and do a little bit of a deep dive at the very end about our current system and kind of how we see that evolving going forward. Yeah, so, the Slack is really the central place for coordinating um, all of the volunteer efforts. And Slack is, I think it's been a very good medium for this. Um, it's easy to kind of customize, organize people. Um, I think it's certainly much better than trying to do it on Facebook. Um, we use a bunch of different tools to make this work. Airtable is largely our backend where we um, both store all of our information, but also how we, um, it's the interface we provide to intake volunteers to manage the distribution and deliveries. So V1 was a Google Sheet, um, people posting in Slack, and um, we had a phone number and flyers. And so people, someone would be manning the phone um, and then entering requests and then people would just pick them up off of Slack and either pay for the groceries themselves or get reimbursed from someone's personal Venmo account. So we did this for one week, um, 1,600 people, 65 deliveries, um, and $4,000. bed -Stuy is a very big neighborhood. Um, last I checked, it's around 100,000 people um, living in like the zone that we service. Um, so being able to split that up into quadrants was very important um, as a way to help delivery volunteers decide 
which requests they can service. Um, yes, there's also setting expectations has been a big learning experience here. Um, it can take a while, you know, as, as we're growing, the requests are growing faster than we can serve them. So being able to set expectations, like it could be a week before we can get this to you. Um, having the intake volunteers be able to like assign priority. Um, and all of this started becoming very cumbersome and complex. So that's kind of where I stepped in um, and uh, the other people on the automation team to start building out something better. So yeah, I've been on our tools, Airtable. Um, if you've never used it before, it's actually pretty great. It provides a spreadsheet interface to a database. Um, you can link records between tables so you get some of the basic database-like functionality while also being able to use that to interface with non-tech folks. Um, and that's definitely at the core of our entire process. Um, has a decent enough API. Sapier uh, was a big part of the first iteration of the automation. Um, we would trigger on new records and post in Slack. Um, unfortunately, it is very expensive. Yeah, Google Voice and Twilio, we switched over from Google Voice to Twilio. It's a little bit more complex to use to get Twilio off the ground, but certainly much easier than using Google Voice. Um, much better interfaces. We were having to like scrape emails. Yeah, so the we have a volunteer form that populates the Airtable database. Um, and Airtable provides a nice form interface for volunteers, makes everything a lot easier. Um, and then we had a Zap, which is like a Zapier automation that would um, grab the volunteer's email and then try and translate that to their Slack username and then take that and invite them to like the delivery volunteers group or the neighborhood group, et cetera. Uh, and that was really helpful trying to organize you know, this group of 2,000 volunteers that had come in over like a week and a half. Um, we also we were using Google Voice, which would send an email to our account. And then we would scrape those emails and enter them into the inbound messages. Um, there were some pretty annoying problems with uh, translating, normalizing what we we're getting from Google Voice, all kinds of parsing errors. Um, so this is a bit of a headache. Uh, and then the intake volunteers, and this is still the, like, the same process, read the inbound messages um, and then determine, um, like, is this something that we need to um, do a delivery for or are we going to call this person back and provide more information? Um, also deduplicating requests if people call multiple times. And so then the intake volunteers will call these people back. Um, and once they have a full request for them, they'll create an intake ticket. Um, and this is what we use to track the life cycle of a delivery. Um, and so each new intake ticket uh, would post to the specific Slack neighborhood channel. Uh, and you can see an example of it here. Uh, and then a delivery volunteer would jump on the thread, claim it, and the intake volunteer would um, assign that record in Airtable. And with this system, the we only post the um, like relatively anonymized data about the request in public Slack channels, and the intake volunteer sends the private data directly to the delivery volunteer. Uh, so that was a big point of friction, having to manually copy everything from Airtable, format it, and send it to the delivery volunteer. Um, yeah, and then we had a separate reimbursements channel where people would 
chime in like, hey, I paid $100 for this delivery. Can you please reimburse me? Um, and that's that's a been an area that we are still having like trouble with managing reimbursements for everyone. So that that was very quick to get off the ground, um, and yeah, 130 deliveries. So we we're doing a little over double the deliveries we were doing the week before. So this is pretty much where our custom um, infrastructure is at right now. Um, we still have the form for volunteers, and then we have, um, we use an Airtable block to triage volunteers into the relevant groups. Um, and this is like, um, you can basically write scripts in Airtable um, that will run over the record and do, uh, Yeah, and so that, um, that's another kind of design principle that I um, was very cautious about, making sure that we everything we build has an interface for the uh, intake volunteer to use. Um, we really, the process is dictated by the intake volunteers, and so it's important that everything has, like everything we build has is interactive for them. Um, especially since we're moving so quickly, things are not um, always going to have like a very smooth interface. So making sure it's not hidden away somewhere in code. Um, yeah, so we use Twilio. Um, the intake tickets are processed um, and we have in our back end a way to trigger um, a function to run on every status change and in intake tickets. So when we get a new intake ticket, we populate some relevant information in the Airtable. We post to the tickets channel. Um, when it gets assigned, we DM the volunteer the information. Um, and then we also DM them a reimbursement form. And when they submit the reimbursement form, um, it links back to the tickets that they completed and closes those tickets. Also in the Slack channel, you can see this post, the, uh, there's a status um, and that post gets updated when a delivery is claimed. So you can see from a glance, the status of a post. Um, so the flow for this, um, actually I'll just, I'll show you all the, the Slack itself. One sec. Cool. Yeah, so this is, um, just the bed -Stuy strong Slack. We have a tickets channel. Um, and so this is where all the tickets get posted. Um, can you all see this? Yep. Yep, great. Um, a problem with posting all of the tickets to the tickets channel is that it incentivizes volunteers to um, pick the latest ticket which is really not what we want. We wanna make sure that we're servicing the first ticket to come in or the highest priority tickets first. So we started doing these digest posts that the bot does. Um, and it's a summary of all of our most important tickets. Um, and this gets updated in real time. Um, and when a ticket's claimed, it gets removed from this post. So this is kind of a central place where volunteers can claim tickets. Um, and you can see people will just respond in the channel. Uh, another principle here is that we've been very careful not to automate pieces of the process that are not really clear yet. One of those is that we don't want um, delivery volunteers um, claiming a ticket completely on their own without ever interacting with an intake volunteer. 
Um, and that's helpful because, you know, maybe the delivery volunteer claimed a ticket that can be bundled with another ticket. Or, you know, maybe their um, efforts right now could be redirected to a more urgent request. We've also started doing these cluster um, posts, and I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. So a change from the original automation, we had four quadrants, um, and these, we were using the quadrants as a way to split the tickets geographically. Uh, but it turns out that almost all of our requests are from the two um, eastern zones in bed um, And so almost none of them are on the Clinton Hill side. Uh, and so that system was actually underutilizing our volunteers by 50%. Um, so we ended up switching to the tickets flow. In considering how to replicate this process, um, I think that's one of the one of the takeaways is that one system is not going to fit everyone's needs. Uh, we've talked to people doing mutual aid in rural areas, um, and this is not, you know, the best setup for that. We rely on people, um, both on foot delivery volunteers and people that have cars. Um, so a lot of this has been tweaked for our use in particular. Great. So here's here's our clustering um, attempt. This is a relatively new endeavor. Um, so people with cars can team up with on-foot delivery volunteers and claim multiple deliveries in one area. Uh, so these are currently being identified by the intake volunteers themselves. Um, so you can see like A29 has, um, is serving 15 people. Um, and so that's a great way to maximize the bang for your buck per delivery. Um, and definitely the direction that we're starting to head in, trying to figure out how we can coordinate multiple delivery volunteers safely and efficiently with little overhead um, to do these clusters. At the same time, um, it's important to remember that these are not our employees. Uh, so we can't you know, tell people like, hey, you are working from like noon to four tomorrow. Here is a list of deliveries that you're going to do back to back. Um, and so I'll, that, I think, has had to guide a lot of the approach in the automation, making sure that what we're doing is pleasant experience for our volunteers. All right. Cool. Yeah, so now we're doing over 200 deliveries a week, $4,000 a day in um, groceries, um, and honestly, it's a little overwhelming. Um, this whole thing has been around for four and a half weeks, um, and it's a lot of effort on the, especially on the intake volunteers and on the delivery volunteers um, to get this done. It's an overview of the database schema. Um, I, I won't sit on this for too long, but you can see the um, how we have the inbound messages that correlate to the intake tickets, and then how we map volunteers to those, and then also the reimbursements which are used by our fund team. Um, I wrote this a long time ago, so it might be a little stale. The as far as technical infrastructure goes, we're using Firebase um, and Firebase functions. Uh, I'd never used it before, but it served us pretty well. It's easy to get off the ground. Um, you don't have to maintain any servers, which I think is a huge plus. Um, it gives you a lot of nice things out of the box. Um, 
it's also really cheap. Zapier, we were we were doing thousands of the called tasks, which is like one like an API call or like running a script or something. Um, and we would have been spending thousands of dollars a month to run off of Zapier and we're spending 50 cents a month to do it with Firebase. Uh, so it was definitely worthwhile. Um, yeah, I think, I think I've covered most of this. Um, in terms of principles that I've taken and the rest of the automation team has done, um, making sure not to over-engineer. This isn't, um, this is evolving very quickly and you know things need to get off the ground now. Um, hunger is an immediate need. Testing is not. <laughs> um, we need to have a, a low barrier to entry, a low technical barrier to entry. Um, so avoiding fanciness, making it comprehensible. Uh, this is also part of thinking about how we can reproduce this um, for other mutual aid groups. Uh, at the same time, something that I've had to, um, that I've struggled with over the past couple of weeks is how to um, structure the engineering. This isn't an open source project. Uh, it's not really the easiest space to jump in and like do your own contribution asynchronously, test on your own, and then bring something back into the fold and then review it and give feedback. Things kind of have to happen very quickly. Um, so we get a request from the intake team and the person tackling that request on the automation side has to do the infrastructure work, the product management work to like figure out what the requirements are, the coding for it, the testing um, in our staging environment, and then pushing it out all in like a day or two days. Uh, and so that flow doesn't really provide a lot of space for feedback. Uh, and that's something that we're certainly still thinking about how to, how to manage. So going forward, we have a couple um, projects that we're working on. I think the what's really driving a lot of the automation um, projects is our delivery backlog. Um, our backlog is over 100 requests now. Um, more and more, I mean, people are calling in, and we just don't have the um, capacity to fill all of these requests. We're not a government organization or a big nonprofit. Uh, so trying to think about how we can maximize the requests that we're serving um, while also making sure that you know, we're not burning out intake volunteers. Uh, and a big part of the automation in that sense is that there has to be, it has to be easy to be an intake volunteer. If you want to take a week off that, you know, has, we have to be able to handle that easily. Um, so that, that means that we need intake trainings, we need the automation to not have um, rough edges so that it just does what people expect it to. Um, we're looking into a live intake map, which you can kind of see uh, in the bottom right. It's a prototype where intake volunteers will be able to manually identify clusters, um, be able to see which tickets are the highest priority, um, which ones are claimed or yet to be claimed. Uh, also, yeah, bulk purchase is another big uh, endeavor. We want to have depots where people, um, where we buy directly from suppliers, store the produce there or non-perishables probably. Um, and uh, have delivery volunteers pick up from those locations when doing their deliveries. That getting that off the ground will probably involve us um, 
you know, having delivery volunteers do half of a request from the depot and the other half from the grocery store. Uh, and being able to manage that process is something that we'll definitely need automation for, um, like live inventory tracking, um, and you know, telling, notifying delivery volunteers that they should stop at this depot here uh, along the way. So all of that is kind of in flight. Uh, also, another big issue that we're running into is with reimbursements. We're most of that 4,000 a day needs to be reimbursed uh, to the delivery volunteers. And as we're trying to scale to bigger deliveries per volunteer, that also means that the uh, delivery volunteer buying groceries is going to have to front more and more money. Um, you know, we've had people that want to do nine deliveries, but they can't front a thousand dollars at the grocery store. Like how many people can, can do that. Um, so one of the initiatives is to get a, a system where we can give out our highest volume delivery volunteers cards that are refillable and put enough money on them to do the deliveries that they have claimed. Uh, and then tracking that as well. Uh, yeah, and then also integrating with other mutual aid organizations. And that'll certainly become more important as time goes on. Uh, we get lots of requests for adjacent neighborhoods and it's, uh, it's really sad when, you know, someone in Crown Heights like really needs um, assistance, but we, you know, are a small organization we can't supply to all of Brooklyn. Um, so being able to effectively triage requests over to other mutual aid organizations is a big piece of this. Yep, teamwork makes the dream work. Um, this all came together very quickly, uh, and I'm really grateful for the, the rest of the automation team. Everyone has really taken on their own um, responsibilities and gotten things done quickly, promptly, uh, and it's been great fun working with everyone. It's, uh, it's also a great way to get out the tension uh, having having an outlet to um, you know talk to people about about this and serve other people in our community is uh, very healing. Cool. That's the structured piece of the presentation. Uh, I would really appreciate donations. Um, I put up all of our info here, and hopefully we'll like send out an email to y'all. Um, it is, I mean, seriously, 100% of donations go to groceries. There is no overhead. The 50 cents that we pay to Google Cloud. Uh, yeah, so I'll, if you all have any questions, I'm happy to like do, do that. I uh, just wanted to first say thanks for coming and talking with us. This is uh, this is really impressive. Um, so I just started getting involved with the Crown Heights Mutual Aid Organization like earlier this week, and awesome. my feeling is that we're like a couple weeks behind you all in terms of like the tech stack. That it's all it's pretty much manual at this point with volunteers like posting things. Um, yeah, and I guess like. It's it's definitely I think to your point about like the how the tech is evolving so quickly I I've been a little intimidated by like figuring out how to get involved with the tech team and I have no idea if we have like as defined a tech team as you have like there's a Slack channel and that's you know what I know goes on um, Do you have mm -hmm. any recommendations for like how, you know if there are good ways to start contributing to the technical side of things um, and or any like also any just things that you're like, oh, I wish I'd known this, you know, two weeks ago, a month ago. I think it was really helpful to have some of your moments about like which services you ended up settling on because I can see that being super useful for, for the Crown Heights work as well. But um, yeah, any thoughts or advice you have would be appreciated. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, firstly, um, it's good stuff. We've, um, I've heard from a couple of the Crown Heights folks and I know that um, there are some people in Bed-Stuy Strong that are, um, 
you know, like semi-active um, in y'all's tech channel. If you've uh, talked to Alex B yet, um, they're like particularly, um, they're like paying attention and feeding me information um, about what y'all are doing. Uh, I would say part of something that I'm just from a distance seeing with the Crown Heights group um, is that the, I think it's easier to build the tech as a like result of what the intake folks are doing. Um, and really probably the biggest benefit for me personally has been having um, a couple of the intake volunteers that are really um, have just been on point with everything and trying to translate exactly what they're doing um, into a system that scales and giving them the like high level perspective that they need. Um, in terms of gotchas, the mm, there have been a couple. Technically, I think the most annoying thing to deal with has been Airbase um, from the. So basically, the the framework that we want is um, every time a record in Airtable changes status do this thing. Um, and so what that looks like in our table is we have a field called status um, with a couple predefined values. And then when we run the automation on that record, we want to take note that we triggered for this status. Um, and Airtable doesn't have a way to notify you every time a record changes. Um, there's like no web hooks. So we have to pull Airtable um, and the the kind of hack here is that we added to all of our tables a meta field that just stores some like JSON data. Um, and one of those is the last seen status. So we go through all of the records. And if we haven't seen one of the statuses yet, we trigger the automation on that. Um, the Another gotcha is that you can't set a default status in our table which is another, or a default, like the, the status is a single field value, and you can't set a default one when you create the record, which is another very annoying um, aspect of this. So a lot of the automation flow that we've ended up working out is when you get a new record, trigger it with like an empty status, update this metadata that you need, like the Slack ID of the volunteer, um, and then once you've done that, um, start triggering the rest of the automation for it. Um, and part of the principle behind having escape hatches for the intake volunteers has been making sure that the every time the automation triggers, it triggers as a result of what's happened in Airtable, and its state is dumped back into Airtable. So that if you want to trigger that same like specific function, you just change the status to um, like a slightly different status. Um, cool. Thank that... you. That's, yeah, that that's super helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, if I am able to get more involved in the tech side, I might you know hit you all up for advice along the way too, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, happy happy to help however I can. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, one question I'm curious about. Um, have you guys been approached or approached the city at all for any amount of like funding or assistance? It just seems like you guys are doing great work and I don't know what the city should be helping if possible. Yeah. Um, it's not my area of expertise. Um, I know we've, we have folks that work with the city or have worked with the city um, on the, leads team. Uh, I've heard that they're trying to find a way to um, fund like food banks and other organizations that are doing deliveries, but I haven't gotten any details on that yet. Um, so hopefully, I mean, that would be, that would be great.
people in the uh, comments channel who I, I thought it might be nice since we're all remote to just like have people raise their hand in the channel. Yeah, I had a quick so. question. Um, yeah, go ahead. This is awesome work. I'm super inspired by it. Um, one thing I was wondering about is how payment works or just like, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that seems like it would require a legal entity uh, to <laughs> kind of do any of it. <laughs> I guess I'm curious like how that works and like how you're interfacing with banks and payments and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so as you can see, we have Venmo, Cash, Google Pay. <laughs> These are all personal accounts. Um, we have a wonderful fund manager who has put their ass on the line with like personal accounts and stuff for now. Um, this is actually one of the more annoying pain points. Each of these apps has limits um, that we're hitting every week for doing reimbursements. Um, so we're trying to get um, a fiscal sponsor, which would be likely a nonprofit in New York that um, can kind of manage the finances for us so that people donate to them and then they give us like a weekly installment that we use to run everything. Uh, so that's kind of the story right now. The vast majority of our donations come in from Venmo. Um, I, I think we've raised almost 70,000 in the past couple of weeks. And all of that is individual donations on Venmo. Uh, so we're trying to be very careful with accepting like credit card payments and other forms of payments because people are really, people are able to use Venmo um, both for giving donations and for getting reimbursements. So that's an important facet of this. Um, and it's, it's a pain in the ass for everyone, but I think it's uh, pretty essential to the way that we run the org. Hey, George. Um, thanks for presenting. Uh, this has been really interesting. Um, I love seeing like the different iterations of your tech stack. Um, and I'm curious, like as you move between different services and you mentioned, for example, Zapier being expensive, but you also mentioned like a very low like AWS bill. Uh, I'm wondering, like, have companies been responsive to the organization? Um, like, I know that some have special pricing for like educational or like nonprofit organizations, um, but as like a brand new organization, you you know can't provide like the 501 tax exempt IRS status. Um, so have they yeah. been flexible? Have they given you like discounted or free services or like how how does that work? And has that uh, like had a big effect on like how you choose over different providers and like. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we we have had good um, good luck actually with getting people to subsidize the cost of their products. Zapier actually subsidized us for like two weeks ish, um, and that subsidy was about to expire. And I took off the last um, automation off of Zapier. Um, and I, I think we're sponsored. Uh, we've gotten something from Airtable, um, from Twilio. Yeah, a bunch of a bunch of different places have like pitched in, which is which is great. Um, a lot of the time, though, it has happened right before we hit like the enterprise limit. Um, so. And, and most of that has happened through someone knowing someone that works with someone at, you know, one of these companies. And are they extending like the, the for the companies that have extended like uh, free or discounted pricing, like do they, are they extending it until like the end of the summer or like, is there a deadline or do you have to continually renegotiate like the deal? And does that worry your team like, like building reliance on these systems and then um, like having Airtable say, oh, like, you know, we're no longer offering, you know, this, this special rate to you. Um, yeah, I, 
Uh, honestly, I've kind of put it out of my mind for a little bit. <laughs> the, I mean, it would be very unfortunate for some of these if we um, lost the sponsorship, like the Zapier would have been catastrophic. Um, I think Airtable, you know, we'd be looking at a couple hundred dollars a month, which is not ideal, but at least at this point, compared to, you know, the size of the operation, it's manageable. Uh, so I'm not worried that we would, you know, just all of a sudden be liable for the huge expense. Um, getting off the ground, though, it definitely was, there were a lot of points where, you know, we were deciding, do we need to build this piece of automation right now? And the question was, how much runway do we have on these free trials? Um, so it certainly is a big consideration. And I think it's, it's much more important when you're getting off the ground. Um, and if anyone is doing like mutual aid and runs into this stuff, like feel free to reach out to us and maybe we can connect y'all to the actual human we talk to at these companies. Awesome, thanks. Hey George, um, thanks for presenting. This has been really impressive. Um, uh, my question actually was also about the payment, so it's kind of been covered, um, but I'll just throw in a follow-up. Um, I'm working with uh, the Queen's uh, DSA mutual aid and kind of interested in the way that you've um, done like the spatial clustering of the incoming requests. And so mm -hmm. my, my questions are like, A, kind of how successful has that been? Has that run into the kind of like upfront payment kind of obstacles you mentioned earlier? Uh, or has it somehow been working out? And also like how technically did you approach the spatial clustering? Like uh, is, is that something you've done in Airtable or like what's the kind of process around that? Yeah, so the um, yeah the clustering is all manual in terms of the intake volunteer um, manually like finding the clusters and um, organizing them. We have a separate table for clusters that just has um, one field with links to all the other tickets. We're still working out the process around this, and there are a lot of a lot of ideas. the The map actually was fairly easy to get a prototype off the ground. Um, the person that did it um, didn't have any like programming experience, um, and so there is honestly like a masterpiece in hacking. It's like dump from Airtable to Google Sheets, run like a formula to like normalize the addresses and then like query Google API and then like use um, like uh, street maps, like public um, interface for pulling these things out of a CSV. Uh, and so that part of it has been um, pretty easy to get off the ground. The automation for it, I think will be a little bit trickier. Um, it'll have to be fairly custom um, you know, it would be a really fun project to do the clustering in the automation. I think technically, though, it's not worth the engineering effort right now. Uh, the payment system, I think, is something that we're going to have to automate fairly soon. We have <clears throat> we have some volunteers that are just doing an amazing number of deliveries. One in particular has done 40, um, which, I mean, I'm, I'm blown away. Um, and their, her and her daughter are like, you know, fronting the cost and then getting reimbursed through Venmo, which, you know, can take a day or if we're backlogged and we've reached our limit, can take even longer. Um, so having a way to be able to front these people money um, is really important for doing the clustering. Uh, and the system that we're working out is a refillable like debit card. So um, the intake leads would approve volunteers for the card. We would get them one of these cards and then the automation, this obviously will not start out fully automated. 
um, the automation will eventually um, automatically transfer funds to that card according to the size of the cluster that they have claimed. Uh, and so that way, we can have people that don't have liquidity doing big deliveries. Um, yeah. Does that answer your like questions around our approach? Is there anything yeah, else? Yeah, no, I think so. That's really helpful. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yield. Uh, Ash had raised a question. I'm curious to hear about how all the technical volunteers keep on the same page with this quickly changing tech, or is it just a small enough team that it can kind of be managed organically? Yeah, for, for right now, it's mostly a small team. Um, I think the it's a lot easier to keep other volunteer groups on the same page. Um, like I think intake volunteers, um, that group scales more easily. Um, but for every you know engineer you add, you have to think about the like um, testing infrastructure. For example, I test with um, basically a staging environment, and we only have one staging environment. Um, also, I have to have access to all of our private data. Um, I have to be a Slack admin. Um, and then on top of that, a lot of the code I write is, you know, comes directly from like conversations, oftentimes in public channels. Um, and I'm not really like doing code reviews because Alex and I, um, we're primarily the ones who've written the code up for the system are just, kind of on the same page. Um, so we only have to sync up every couple, you know, every week or so. Um, so that's that's kind of the state we're in, which makes it really hard to add more engineers to the project. Um, I think a big piece of it is that the people that do come on to the automation side have to be like extra self-sufficient, like more so than you know, you might have to be on a normal team um, and to really have to be familiar with the intake process, the delivery process, how we do reimbursements, and then also just how the infrastructure works. And that's kind of a big ask um, for someone coming on. Um, it's honestly, it's like been a bit stressful trying to figure that out, um, how to be inclusive, make sure that we have enough people on the automation actually building things so that you know it's not the bottleneck. Um, so far though, it hasn't been the bottleneck. Most of the issues that have come up are outside of the, um, like most of the issues that need to be resolved are not directly blocked on the automation team. Does that, uh, did I answer the all the parts of your question? Yes, thank you very much. I see another question um, about how to get involved um, while not doing deliveries. Um, I think intake is a huge need that we have right now. Uh, the, I mean, we have a very big intake backlog, which is probably at this point hundreds of deliveries that need to get done. Um, so calling these people back and you know trying to understand their needs is um, super super important. It's also, I mean, it's a hard job. Um, truly, it's. You know, I have a lot of admiration for the intake folks. Um, and, you know, outside of even if, you know, we don't get a delivery out to the person that we called back, that is still a very meaningful interaction. Um, you know, if you're in need and, you know, just having someone on the phone, like, talk, you know, 
talk to you about it, like try to see what other options there are. Um, you know, we, we refer out to other groups. We refer to, you know, places you can get meals in the city. Um, so that, yeah, that's a hugely impactful um, role for volunteers. Great, thank you. I had a, a general question. I know you touched on the different free services and like the many uh, companies that are offering uh, like extended standard plan trials if you're working uh, directly in coronavirus relief. Um, and you mentioned that like you're trying not to think of it right now, but is there a, you feel like the Slack uh, wants to live beyond this crisis? Like, there's certainly it's going to continue being hunger in bed -Stuy, for example. So uh, were that the case, would you be looking to, like, swap out the services that can be replaced by something open source, like even even Slack, for example? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh. Um, it's funny, like getting asked questions and then like thinking about it for the first time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I've actually, um, pre coronavirus, I did um, a lot of volunteering with NYC mesh, uh, and it's also Slack based. Um, and there was a lot of talk about how do we build something that people can use that is open source runs like, you know, from New York, um, instead of some, you know, having your data on some server somewhere. Uh, and, and I think kind of the results of that thought process is going to be similar for bed -Stuy strong. And it's, it's really just about accessibility. Um, I don't think we can kill Slack entirely right now. Um, the alternatives are, getting better, but still, I don't see anything as seamless as Slack. Uh, there's looked at Matrix in the past, which like lets you bridge multiple platforms. So that seems like a, an option. Um, there's also just a problem with Slack in particular. There is a very high technical barrier to entry for using Slack. Um, and a huge part of our volunteer onboarding is here's how you use Slack. Um, and then they do stuff like drop a new UI change um, on you, just surprise. Uh, so stuff like that is, it's certainly, how do I phrase this? It's been a, a big concern for me personally that are we getting um, engagement from the community on Slack? Um, like most of the people that we're serving are not on Slack or like might not even have access to Slack from like a smartphone or a computer. Um, so are we, you know, serving people and like you know, being able to engage with other organizations that have been in bed for a long time via Slack. And largely, I think the answer to that is no. Um, Slack is just not like the most accessible medium. Facebook is where a lot of the like existing online bed communities are. Um, so that's something that we have you know, a couple of people working on specifically how do we better integrate with other organizations in bed -Stuy. Um And I think the software that we use is one piece of that. So eventually getting off of Slack would be nice. It just seems like a, a big ask right now. Hey, um, another question. Um, just like thinking about all the efforts that are springing up and that are decentralized and, um, you know, maybe resulting in duplication of effort um, and, uh, and, you know, various teams are at different stages of like kind of evolution in terms of their sophistication. Like 
how do you think about uh, consolidation of efforts and like the values of remaining decentralized versus like more, I don't know, shared infrastructure effort or things like that? Um, yeah, that, kind of wondering about that. Yeah, so decentralized in the sense of um, multiple, like different mutual aid organizations doing their own thing versus um, kind of having a larger collective um, to share infrastructure or process? Yeah, exactly. OK. Um, yeah, I. we've been talking about this in Medstai Strong for a little bit um, and trying to think about how to take our process and hand it to other people. Um, and this presentation actually came out of a like focus group we did with some other people doing mutual aid from around the US. Um, and I think really the, the first step is just sharing information about what we're doing. Um, ideally having some standardization around the tools that we're using. <clears throat> Airtable is a great example of this. I know mutual aid uh, .nyc is also using Airtable and that's a big boon. Um, being able to share that you know, system for storing information is huge. Uh, in terms of the code and the actual infrastructure, <clears throat> trying to box it up into like a nice platform and then ship that out to other people uh, would be amazing. Uh, just as with like most engineering projects, there's a lot of tailoring to the specific needs of um, to your specific goal. So that seems like a it might it might be a big ask to um, to like make the infrastructure generic. <clears throat> um, I am certainly interested, though, um, and like am trying to think about how we can keep bed strong specific things abstracted away from the generic, like, this is how you run a mutual aid organization. Um, but in terms of providing like an open source piece of software that you can use to bootstrap your own mutual aid organization, um, I'm skeptical as to like how possible that would be. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And uh, my my question is like very related to groups and and what you're what you've been just discussing. Um, like, I wonder like when an organization um, that has like similar ambitions uh, as yours comes to you and like asks like, what do I do? Where do I start? What are the resources that are available? Like, what do you point them to today? Like, is there, um, like it, it is very hard to like, you know, package this code that's like meant for a specific community and like just give them that. But like the information that you want to share, like, um, is there like a Google Doc or is there like a forum that people like different um, aid organizations are, are coming together and having these discussions? And, you know, I think the point you made earlier about like really hesitating to build automation before you kind of understand like the problem or like how people like want to interact, like applies to the packaging of code and like, you know, envisioning some framework that other organizations can kind of plug into. So if the if like the priority is sharing information and like getting feedback uh, from the community, like um, is there a current place for that or do you have visions on sharing information in a broader way? Um, yeah. Yeah, we, um, this has all been coming together over the past couple of days. Um, so we, we have this, PowerPoint, we have a design doc that I made a while back on the infrastructure. We have a, a repo with uh, like our code um, that I think, I mean, if I were doing this from scratch and I had like that as a reference, I think that would be helpful. Um, 
there's, you know, we have like recordings of similar talks to this. Um, so that is kind of what we have right now. Um, there's also a, um, Alyssa who, um, is like an admin, but also like, you know, with a particular focus in automation, um, is doing an article with the Civicist about kind of our infrastructure and how to um, just kind of explaining that. So I'm hoping that those um, kind of all of that will serve as like knowledge transfer that people can look at and get, you know, insight into how they want to structure their process. Uh, I do think it would be really helpful to have a central place to talk about these things. Um, be that a you know, mailing list or like another Slack group specifically for people doing mutual aid um, infrastructure. Uh, I think mutual aid.nyc is a great vessel for this. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see more of this and personally to be involved with, um, you know, trying to get more of these off the ground. Um, it's also just from a like identity perspective, it's, it just doesn't feel great to have, to be part of a mutual aid organization that is organized well, and um, to be right next to neighborhoods that don't have um, an organization that is, you know, as effective solely because of chance um, I, you know, I, I don't think you can really put it on anything else. Um, just luck that like certain people saw it at the right time. Um, yeah, not very structured answer, but collection of ideas. I just want to be conscious of time because we're uh, just at an hour right now since we started. Uh, Sapan did mention uh, a company called Clay or Clay.run that does some uh, maybe Airtable-like uh, and Lambda function as well, integration with other services and uh, wanted to mention them in the chat, but uh, I think we should call it for, uh, you know, so, okay. so uh, George, I want to thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Is bedsidestrong.com still the website to go to if you're interested in volunteering if you're in the neighborhood? <laughs> yes, um, I'd go to that and then you can see our Slack. Um, our Slack is also just bedstystrong.slack.com. Um, those are the, the um, cash apps that I provided there are like best ways to donate right now. Um, if, yeah, also probably in a week we'll have fiscal sponsorship. So if, um, you know, that like donating through that is interesting. Let me know and I can get back to you. Um, yeah, swing by. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I'll send you all my email. Um, I really appreciate you all uh, listening in. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much, George. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you all. Bye, everyone.